very good morning and welcome to Sky News Breakfast. It's good to have you with us. Sky News has spoken to a British man who's recently returned from the front line in eastern Ukraine after deciding to go there and fight while he was lying on the sofa watching Netflix at home. Douglas, who's 26, fixes tractors for a living and had no military background. But he quit his job and volunteered to join the war. Our national correspondent, Tom Parmenter, has his story. As a mother, it was very, very tough. A nightmare. He wanted to go and help. And I totally got all that. But I didn't like this feeling. And I didn't expect it to still be so raw, feeling so raw after it. They thought their boy might not return home from the front line in Ukraine. But Douglas did make it back to the family farm in southwest Scotland. The helicopters are the worst. I mean, you'll hear the... <laughs> By this point, you're crawled up the wall going, not today, please not today. He had no military training but still decided he had to go. I was sat here actually drinking a, a beer, watching Netflix. Uh, made my decision, packed up the stuff and left my job an awful lot. You know, like I'm young enough, I can contribute to a, a better world. He was known as Soap, a video game character who was now in the reality of trench warfare. They shelled the hell out of us. You're sitting in a hole in the ground, which is the wrong hit. You, there's no coming out of it. We've seen it. Then for a few of our guys, like we get, to, we get to come home, but they don't. They don't. The sadness is blended with the exhilaration of liberating villages that have been occupied by Russians. You know, there's like people lined up in the streets with tabletops selling vegetables, there's people starting to rebuild houses. You'd actually see that, it just made everything worthwhile. You told me that you were considering whether you go back. I, I think I've packed and unpacked that bag several different times. To go back to the front, to do something else, to... It's, 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 and then the effect on the family and friends. It's, a, it's quite a dilemma. I think it would be a suicide mission if he did go back to you know, Ukraine. I really do, mentally and physically for him. Um, he's been, you know, he's been shot at, nearly killed, concussion. Um, the list goes on. I mean, we're lucky we've got Douglas back, but in Ukraine, there's a lot of people that won't be coming back. This war, which became his war, is far from over. Tom Parmenter, Sky News. Well, let's just have a look at this morning's other main developments uh, on the war in Ukraine. Uh, and breaking news this morning, the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, is to visit China next week. Last September, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced a strategic partnership with a Belarusian leader, who is, of course, a staunch ally of Russia's Vladimir Putin. And yesterday, Beijing called for a comprehensive ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine and a gradual de-escalation. In Bulgaria, thousands of demonstrators took to the streets of Sofia to express their support for Ukraine. They were joined by some of the 50,000 Ukrainian refugees who found shelter in Bulgaria in the last year. Meanwhile, it's been announced that around 3,000 tickets for this year's Eurovision Song Contest will be allocated to Ukrainians now living in the UK. It will, of course, be hosted in Liverpool this May, and the UK government has also announced £10 million worth of funding for the event. Now, the former leader of the DUP has accused the government of politicising the monarchy after Sky News revealed that King Charles was being lined up to play a key ceremonial role in the final stages of negotiations with the EU over Northern Ireland. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, has this exclusive report. King Charles in Northern Ireland, just days after taking the throne. He says this nation is a personal priority for him, just as it was for his mother. With a Brexit deal on Northern Ireland imminent, Sky News can reveal that Number 10 had put in motion a meeting between the King and the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. 
The meeting, now cancelled, would have happened at Windsor Castle today. The new deal was expected to be called the Windsor Agreement. Labour say it would have jeopardised the political neutrality of the monarchy. It seems that there is panic within number 10 and they are reaching for all sorts of quite absurd policies and levers to try and pull. Now, I do not know how a thought of involving the king can pass somebody's mind and reach it to their mouth before they realise that this is a very, very unwise policy to choose because it has const constitutional implications. Uh, it certainly would be very highly insensitive to the politics of Northern Ireland. Uh, and it certainly is nothing we should ever be involving His Majesty in. The support of the DUP for any new Brexit deal important for Rishi Sunak, but the Sky News revelation prompting a backlash from the very unionists he needs to win over. Former DUP leader Nigel Dodds said, To plan for politicising the monarchy in this way is very serious and reinforces the questions about Number 10's political judgement over the protocol. We are days, maybe just hours away from a new Brexit deal being agreed to try and sort out issues in Northern Ireland and positive noises on Friday night after a call between Rishi Sunak and the head negotiator for the EU, Ursula von der Leyen. But it will be controversial, which is why you'd expect Rishi Sunak and the King and both sets of advisers to be so cautious about involving the monarchy. Had a meeting gone ahead, it would have been enormously controversial. If it had gone ahead in this context, I think it would have been extremely significant. I think it would have been one of the most profound uh, uh, events and consequences for the crown of Charles III's reign, because he would have been putting himself right into the middle um, of a highly contentious political debate. A huge job ahead for number 10. This revelation has not made a deal any easier to sell. Rishi Sunak trying to make peace with Europe but can't escape the menace from his backbenchers. Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, to discuss this further is our political correspondent, Rob Powell, who joins me now from Westminster. Um, hi again, Rob. Uh, as Sam was just saying there, how much do you think this contentious revelation that King Charles may have been involved is going to overshadow what is set to be a rather defining moment for Rishi Sunak? Well, it risks angering the very people that Rishi Sunak needs to keep on board if he's to get this Brexit deal done without there being an almighty civil war inside the Conservative Party. You saw the reaction of the DUP uh, and Lord Dodds there in Sam's piece, clearly uh, unionists for whom the monarchy is very important. Also, Tory MPs, though, Jacob Rees-Mogg, a Brexiteer, um, has told Sky News overnight uh, that this plan would border on a constitutional impropriety. We already know that Boris Johnson has been sounding off against the plans and not necessarily guaranteeing that he would vote for them. So I think it shows a degree of political naivety that this was even suggested, although Number 10 will, of course, say that any meeting between the King and Ursula von der Leyen would have been separate to the actual Brexit process. The optics, the visuals, though, clearly would have inserted the king into this process. Uh, and we are at a moment where we look to be edging towards a state where, the where a Brexit agreement could be done with the European Union. There was a call between Rishi Sunak and Ursula von der Leyen last night. That was said to have uh, yielded good progress and been positive. Conservative MPs have been put on standby uh, as well for a possible vote as soon as Monday. But not a helpful development uh, at a pretty crucial point for the Prime Minister. OK, Rob, for now, thanks very much. Speak to you again in the next hour. Now, people have described their whole house shaking after a small earthquake in South Wales overnight. The European Mediterranean Seismological Centre said a 3.8 magnitude earthquake was recorded eight miles north of the Rhondda Valley in South Wales just before midnight. And the British Geological Survey, the UK's main provider of this sort of data, has not yet issued any information. However, we are hearing from some of you. People have taken to Twitter, sharing their experiences. One person tweeting, thought someone was breaking into my house. No, just an earthquake in South Wales. Another said, we can confirm the walls of our house shook in earthquake just after midnight in South Wales. Felt like a car had driven into the house. And another tweeted, uh, we've had many earthquake tremors before in Wales, but that tremor shook my house to the core in Ebba Vale. 
And did you experience the earthquake? Well, we would love to hear from you. If you felt it, you can get in touch with us. You can go to the Your Report tab on the Sky News mobile app, or you can tweet me directly at Sally Lockwood. And we do have a few more of you who've uh, got in touch in the last hour. Matt O'Shee from Gwent has told us that his whole house shook for about five seconds. And others said it felt like their property had been hit by a car. Uh, I'm in Rimney uh, and felt the house shake, looked online to see if anyone else did, and it was an earthquake in South Wales. I think I need, I need a change of trousers. That tweet was from Chris Otley. Thanks, Chris, for that. Um, and Helen uh, Casewell added, our whole house shook in Rassau, Ebba Vale, and woke my husband up, really frightened us. Uh, and lastly, I've, I've, we've also heard from Jack Hill, also in Gwent, who said, I thought some idiot had driven into my front door the way my room shook. No, Jack, turns out it was an earthquake in South Wales. We'd love to hear from you uh, if you were also affected. You can get in touch with us directly at Sky News or you can tweet me directly at Sally Lockwood. And no doubt, I'll also hear from some of you about my appalling pronunciations uh, on Welsh names. So apologies if I've made any mistakes there. But we've loved hearing from you. Do get in touch. Also making the news this morning, a fifth person has now been arrested in connection with the shooting of a police officer in Northern Ireland. Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell was shot multiple times in Omar on Wednesday night in front of his young son, and he remains critically ill. A 43-year-old man has been arrested in the Stewartstown area under the Terrorism Act, and four other men aged between 22 and 47 have also been arrested. A couple has made history by holding the first female same-sex wedding in the British Antarctic Territory, witnessed by a colony of penguins. Sarah and June Seidner Cayman tied the knot on Valentine's Day. Congratulations to them. That is a rather original one. To the US now, where producers of the movie Rust have agreed to pay a $100,000 fine for safety breaches following the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Meanwhile, a video has emerged of Alec Baldwin practicing firing a gun on the film set just a week before the incident. Well, joining me now to discuss this further is our correspondent, Sadia Chowdhury. Uh, hi to you, Sadia. Um, this video, very interesting, um, and it's emerging, of course, uh, around the same time, not only are there quite big legal proceedings in place, but also a lot of scrutinies emerged about the sort of training that Alec Baldwin had for firing this gun. Yeah, lots of questions about what happened on the set. And uh, this video, let's have a look at it straight away. This video obtained uh, by our colleagues at NBC News uh, shows Alec Borden coming out of a church, is firing a gun. This is during rehearsals and it's been obtained through a freedom of information request. And it shows him during rehearsals firing that gun. We don't know much more about the details, but it was in a similar uh, incident uh, during a similar rehearsal that in 2021, uh, a, a, a live round from one of these prop guns was discharged, killing uh, Helena Hutchins. Um, and she was a 42-year-old cinematographer uh, killed on the uh, set uh, during the making of this film. Now, the latest in this is that the film's producers have agreed to pay a $100,000 fine. That's being paid to the Occupational Health and Safety Bureau in New Mexico. It's been reduced. It's taken almost a year for, of them negotiating, reducing it down by about £30,000. Now, the film's producers say that their intention has always been to resume production because they want to complete the film. They say that's the best way to honour Helena Hutchins uh, and, and her, her role in the film. Uh, and it is one of several legal proceedings. We know, of course, that Alec Baldwin is going through criminal charges, facing two charges of involuntary manslaughter um, in a case uh, in the US, as well as facing a civil lawsuit from the family of Helena Hutchins, um, Alec Borden, of course, denies those criminal charges. His lawyers say that this case uh, is uh, a farce and a, a, a miscarriage of justice. OK, Sadia, thanks very much for the update. Thank you. Now, millions of Nigerians will head to the polls this morning in the most competitive and unpredictable elections yet. It's Africa's largest democratic exercise, but the continent's most populous nation and largest economy is at a critical junction with record unemployment, worsening insecurity and a crippling cash crisis. Well, our Africa correspondent Yusra al joins me now live from Lagos. Good to see you, Yusra. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. Certainly, uh, Nigeria is facing a number of challenges. 
Uh, and it is hoped that this election could prove something of a turning point. Yeah, I mean, of the 93.4 million Nigerians who signed up to vote, more than 7 million of them are here. Lagos is the state with the most sign-ups in the country. It's also home to Africa's most populous city and the economic capital of the country. Here is where you can really feel the pinch of the economy and the cash shortage. We spent time with people over the last few days, and here is what we found out. It's election time in Nigeria. And all around Lagos, promising smiles are asking to be chosen. A new administration is forming that will govern the country for the next four years. But Africa's largest population is preoccupied with personal matters. Here, on a single road in the economic capital, bustling banks are the bad kind of busy. We're on one of the main streets in Lagos, and all along this road are crowds of people standing outside of banks waiting to get their hands on some cash. People are angry. Unable to access their own funds to buy basic essentials. 3.30 the morning I was here. They said they will answer us before 8 o'clock. From 8 o'clock now to now, you never see anything to collect. I'm not going to put to anybody. I'm not going to put for anybody at all. I'm putting to my God. Uh, an, an, an hungry man is an angry man. The cash shortage comes after a currency redesign policy was introduced by incumbent President Hamadou Buhari, said to combat illicit cash flows and vote buying. Central Bank is trying to control the money in circulation because they feel they have too much cash outside of the banking system. You don't have um, like what you have in the UK where people would use um, cards to pay. It's cash based. So people can't get to the offices, people can't. Uh, pay for things in the market. And so the hustle of everyday life has become even harder. The despair is driving a rift between the people and their potential new leadership. We have governments, we have politicians, but all, most of them, like, like, how should I put They're just tips. They don't want to spend money. They, want, they don't want to spend money on their youth. They just want to spend money only on themselves. But the hope is that this discontent has pushed Nigerians to the polls rather than away from them. I urge all Nigerians to actually vote. It's, it's necessary. It's a civic duty, not for yourself, but for your generations to come. More than 93 million people have registered to vote. And those that cast their ballots fulfilling their civic duty are banking on Nigeria's new rulers to fulfill theirs and bring about some much needed change. And Yusra, uh, give us a picture. Yusra, give us a picture of the main contenders the uh, in this race. Uh, it sounds like there could be a historic runoff. Yeah, I mean, this is the tightest race in Nigeria's political history since democracy was introduced in 1999. You've got two main front runners. You've got the the ruling party's Bola Ahmed Tanubu is the former governor of Lagos. You've got the main opposition's parties, Ab Atiku Abu Bakr, who is a former vice president. His party, the People Democratic Party, has ruled the country since 1999, except in the last eight years of President Mohamedou Buhari's administration. These are the two main frontrunners, but there is a wild card in the race. You've got the lesser-known Labour Party's Peter Obi. He's more than a decade younger than his two opponents. He's 61 years old. He's a former banker. He's also the former governor of an Anambra state, and he is galvanizing young people here. Now, he may be unlikely to garner the state majority vote needed to win, but what he might do is split the popular vote enough to lead to a runoff, which would be, as you said, the first in the country's history. OK, Yusra, thanks very much indeed. Back to the war in Ukraine now. And a year on, no end in sight to the conflict. To discuss this further, I'm joined by former special advisor to the commanding general of the US Army in Europe, Mark Voyager. A very good morning to you. Thank you very much uh, indeed for joining us. Uh, now, you are in uh, Sofia in Bulgaria, and of course, there's been large protests there in support of Ukraine. What, what's the feeling in Bulgaria? Good morning, Sally, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, well, the feeling is that, uh, you know, for the last year, um, Russia has been uh, waging this unjust, brutal, atrocious war against uh, effectively a, a neighbor of Bulgaria in, in the region. 
so many there um, here rather uh, protested and joined in this uh, um, protest. But of course, the society is divided, unfortunately, uh, because the Russian propaganda is quite active um, across uh, Europe and in particular in Bulgaria. So um, you know, Russian trolls, you know, Russian messages are being pushed through, um, you know. Uh, shady internet resources. So unfortunately, there are, there are also many who are uh, doubtful, who uh, think they support uh, uh, Putin and, and Russia's goals. But but what we saw yesterday was really impressive uh, on on the part of those who understand that the future uh, of uh, Ukraine is in Europe uh, uh, and that Ukraine uh, really defends uh, Europe's and and the West's democracy and it, it belongs to Europe. It's um, it's our best uh, hope. Uh, for halting any future Russian advances uh, toward uh, uh, additional NATO members or EU members. Yeah, certainly. We, we've seen, we're looking at some extraordinary images from Sofia um, yesterday. You know, you, of course, Bulgaria has taken in around 50,000 Ukrainian refugees. Um, little surprise, there's so much support there uh, for Ukrainians. But it's, it's just interest me, interested me that you've talked about the fact that there is a lot of Russian propaganda, which is also getting through uh, to people in other parts of Europe outside of Russia, and it is having an impact. How much does that concern you about the wider security issues in Europe? Uh, it's fundamental to the security of uh, Europe because information warfare is central to what we call um, Russian hybrid warfare. It is uh, uh, the, the pillar of hybrid warfare, really. Uh, and even when uh, military power fails on the battlefield, which is uh, what's happening now uh, in Ukraine, you know, the Russians are, um, are not winning, as we can see. Uh, still, they're able to project those messages. Um, of, um, of, uh, with uh, a certain degree of confidence. I mean, you saw Putin's speech. I mean, he spoke and acted as if he's a winner and as if Russia will win in the long run. And unfortunately, many, um, I would say, across Europe uh, may be buying some of those messages. And definitely many in the, in the uh, so-called global south, uh, among those countries, for example, that voted uh, uh, to, opted to remain neutral during the vote in the EU. And they definitely, uh, unfortunately, see this conflict is, is framed within this uh, new uh, colonialist framework. Uh, and so uh, the Western diplomacy must work um, uh, actively and not only you know to uh, to uh, create a united front against Russian propaganda within the west West in, uh, as a whole, but also uh, among countries of uh, outside of our region in the global south. Uh, and of course, uh, we've seen China taking a much more active role uh, in recent weeks when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, Chinese, uh, the foreign, Chinese foreign minister visiting Moscow uh, this week and breaking news this morning that uh, the leader of Belarus will be visiting China later this month as well. Uh, do you uh, believe the US uh, intelligence that we could soon see China providing uh, lethal weapons to Ukraine? The, uh, our own intelligence uh, has been quite good at uh, pinpointing uh, such, uh, you know, future developments. You know, the warnings before the war started. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I would actually trust them, um, and uh, I would uh, just say that the, you know, the proposed plan uh, uh, by China is 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 a uh, really a double-faced effort uh, to try to portray China as a peacemaker on a global scale, while at the same time. Uh, they are uh, effectively negotiating with Russia, as uh, also journalistic investigations uh, show the, uh, the German Der Spiegel uh, and, um, and then other uh, resources um, show that they are preparing to potentially sign a deal, uh, contract rather, with uh, Russia to supply drones. So on the one hand, you know, uh, over um, kind of projections of this, uh, you know, peaceful peacemaker image, on the other hand, uh, potentially attempts to uh, support Russia's war effort just because China doesn't want uh, NATO to expand. I mean, they spoke of this uh, indivisible security. It's the mantra that the Russian foreign ministry has been pushing through, you know, no NATO expansion. And obviously, uh, keeping the West uh, um, engaged in Ukraine is also uh, also plays um, uh, in uh, China's favor. Uh, so, you know, I would, I would, I would think this is uh, what may may happen uh, if the war continues that China will will ultimately uh, supply some sort of uh, lethal aid uh, together with uh, you know with the electronic components uh, components and, and financial instruments that they're already uh, providing uh, to facilitate Russia's war effort. Yeah, as you say, U.S. intelligence has been largely extremely accurate in terms of predicting uh, the developments of this war. If indeed China does provide lethal 
aid to Ukraine, to Russia, what difference would that make and, and how concerning is that? Well, uh, in the first place, uh, that would mean China is, is becoming a party to this uh, war uh, with all the um, uh, consequences of this. I mean, there will be really heavy sanctions uh, imposed on them, uh, both by the U.S., but also, I, I would think, by the European Union and by Europe uh, as a whole. And China doesn't really want to lose its European markets. Uh, you know, it, it may uh, be in a state of confrontation or at least tensions with the U.S., but, you know, the, US, uh, the EU markets are critically important for, for China. Um, by this, uh, President Xi would show that uh, he is uh, really ideologically aligned with Putin. I mean, we all know that. But now he would have to take this next step and really um, engaging uh, China the, the same way as, as uh, Iran. I mean, effectively, uh, a country that supplies um, military, uh, lethal military aid to, uh, to support the efforts of, of, a, of an aggressor in an unjust, uh, unprovoked, uh, brutal war of uh, extermination. So that would uh, deal a very heavy blow to China's uh, reputation. Uh, across the world, at least in the eyes of the West, and of course with all the economic and political consequences of that uh, act. Yeah, we certainly find ourselves in tense geopolitical times. Mark Voyager, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Welcome back. Now, a war of words has broken out over Ireland's plans to put cancer warnings on all bottles of alcohol. Yes, you heard that right. The European Commission gave the Irish the green light, despite angry protests from major wine producing countries, especially Italy, where wine is a £12.5 billion industry. From there, Stephen Murphy has a story. Giuliani. Italy is the world's number one wine producer. But it's more than just a commodity. Here in Valpalicella, wine is intrinsically heritage, culture and a way of life. That's why Ireland's plan to slap cancer warnings on their product has caused such shock. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's over, over the limits. It's over the limits. Under Ireland's pioneering legislation, all alcohol products, not just wine, will have labels like these, warning of liver disease and the link to fatal cancers. We know that we have the uh, longevity uh, after the Japanese is the, the area with the, uh, the maximum of longevity. Why that? Because of the cancer. They come from the alcohol. Come on. The vines may be empty at this time of the year, but when you come to a region like Valpalicella, you really get a sense of how crucial wine is to the Italian economy. It's an industry worth around 14 billion euro a year and it employs around 1.3 million people. That's why Italy sees this Irish plan as such a threat. We consider this a dangerous precedent at European level and uh, we think that these terrifying warning labels are not uh, the right way to inform uh, properly the consumer. If these will be followed by other member states in particular, they will be very damaging for the, for the Italian wine industry and exporters in particular. The Italian government is furious. The country's foreign minister described the Irish plan as absurd and an attack on the Mediterranean diet. But the Irish are determined to plough ahead and they have the full support of health campaigners. It is the first in the world, and this is why Ireland is a hero for the rest of the world. The science is very clear. Alcohol causes cancer. It is about telling the truth, and it's about the people's right to know. Italians in Ireland say they're not alone in their opposition. I'm sure all Europe, Spain, Fra France, uh, eventually they're not happy. I just spoke with a few wine importers and they told me they're all in the, same, uh, in the same boat on this. The major winemaking countries say the Irish plan is in breach of single market rules and it's currently being examined by the World Trade Organization. Legal action has been threatened and it seems certain this European wine war will continue to bubble. Stephen Murphy, Sky News in Northern Italy. Well, with us this morning to review uh, today's papers, our broadcaster and journalist Thomas Copeland and anthropologist Marianne O'Hotter. Good to see you both again. Thanks so much. Uh, let's start with the front page of the Mirror, uh, Marianne, if I may. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Therese, Therese coffee, I should say. Therese coffee and turnips. Tell us more. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, let them eat turnips. If you can't find cucumbers or tomatoes in the shop, which you might not be able to find, or if you do, they'll be pretty expensive. 
to raise coffee has said, well, we should be eating more turnips. We should cherish what we do well in Britain, which is obviously eat, uh, growing turnips, perhaps not so much eating turnips. Uh, comically, um, turnips have now had a bit of a run on them, so you might not find turnips in the shops either. Oh, um, uh, quite it's... delicious. Go on, Flying carry on, sorry. They're all right. Yeah, they're all right. I mean, they're not the same as eating a salad, but they're, they're pretty good in the, on their own terms. I mean, in my opinion, <laughs> it really is the world's most boring vegetable. Um, but that said, we do have an abundance of them. Thomas, what do you make of the fact that politicians are coming out with lines like this? Do you think it's, it's a good thing or is it, is it slightly odd? Well, I mean, it's, it's a politically silly thing to do ever to name one specific vegetable towards which you recommend <laughs> the public in the context of a food shortage, because invariably you will then be bombarded on social media with pictures of shelves lacking that one particular food. I think it's a pretty rookie error. And somebody as senior as an environmental secretary could have probably avoided that one. I mean, listen, it's one of these stories where um, ultimately, and actually Marianne's made a really good point there, it's less about shortages and more about prices and feeds into a much wider problem to do with you know, cost of living and how much, how much cheaper junk food is and bad food is. Uh, you know, as compared to the kind of healthy food that we want to encourage people to eat. Um, so uh, it's probably, and again, you know, in the context of, of Brexit, we were talking about it in the last hour and we'll talk about it in the next hour again. These are the kind of really difficult things that, that have been a consequence of Brexit inside the mirror. And I encourage people to read it. It goes through really nicely, actually, all the different reasons for some of these shortages to do with higher costs. We've had some bad weather. The cost of homegrown food has gone up. Fuel is through the roof. Fertilizer is through the roof in terms of prices. And also Brexit means that uh, you know European suppliers are less likely to 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 want to send their food over over this side of the English Channel. And that means that um, it's you know either you're faced with shortages or you're faced with much higher prices. And that's what consumers have to put up with on top of all the other increasing costs that they're facing at the moment. Okay, Thomas, I am calling time on turnips. That's enough turnip <laughs> chat uh, for the morning. Marianne, let, let's jump ahead to page nine of the Times. Uh, Laura, who's in my ear this morning, has been saying, let's do the pig story. No, it's actually a pug story. Moon pig, pug though, story, yeah. the card, the card maker Moon pig has withdrawn cards featuring pugs, not pigs. Explain why. Yeah. Yes, it is, it's, it's easy to misread that, but it is pugs, you know, the, the breed of dog with the short, flat faces and the bulgy eyes. Some people think they're super cute. Other people go, that is exactly human folly translated into animal cruelty because uh, this particular breed of uh, dog is 54 times more likely to have obstructed airway disorders because of the way that we've bred them. Really short, short in the leg, um, bulging eyes, like those kind of classic pug um, features and French bulldog features as well, as well, have got more and more enhanced as we've bred them, even since Victorian times. So Queen Victoria had pugs, but they were kind of longer snouted, longer limbed, and therefore healthier than what you would get now if you bought a pedigree pug. So Peter, the animal welfare charity, have been lobbying Moonpig, the card manufacturers, to say, please stop putting pugs on the fronts of greetings cards because they're cute and people like sending them because it's 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 enabling more animal cruelty it's making this seem normal it's making it seem desirable people want to own pugs therefore people breed pugs and the pugs are the ones who suffer so moonpig have gone yeah all right fair enough we're not going to design any more cards with pugs on we're not going to source any more cards with pugs on uh, all french bulldogs <clears throat> And um, Peter say, this is just the start. They're going to kind of approach other card companies to follow suit. And the broad question is how we as a society take our responsibilities for the pets that we keep. Um, bearing in mind that Austria, Germany, the Netherlands and Norway have all put breeding restrictions on animals, on uh, dog breeds that are considered to be basically not able to live a quality of life because of the way that we've bred them. OK, Thomas, it's probably a bit too risky to try and introduce another uh, story with the time we've got left, I'm afraid. Uh, so a quick thought from you on pugs. <laughs> Well, I, I confess, notwithstanding the number of pugs that I clearly see on the front of greeting cards, I've never found them particularly cute. And as a direct consequence, maybe that will lose me some of my many, many online fans. But I think that, <laughs> you know, as a consequence of the way that they've been bred, they have a rather frustrating breathing pattern that annoys me as they pass in the street. Um, that's definitely, I don't know why somebody's going to attack me online. 
for that. But you know, the, the, I, I, I kind of I broadly agree. Actually, this is really unhealthy for dogs, and it does nothing for humans. And there's make a great many ways in which you know a cruelty is dealt on to animals, and there's justifiable in some ways reasons for doing it because we need you know meat in which to live, and the way in which we. Uh, the way in which we our society operates requires some of that. Pugs is not one of them. We okay. can definitely live without breeding pugs in this way. Thomas, Marianne, great to see you both. See you again in the next hour. Thanks so much uh, for that. And we'll have all uh, the news at the top of the hour, including all the latest on Ukraine. Stay with us.